a chi-squared test for independence may give a clear answer about the possible independence among two categorical variables, but it tells by itself nothing beyond this, and that's a bit disappointing. In this video I'll try to take the interpretation of the chi-squared test a step further and explain how you can learn more about the strength and the pattern of the association between the two variables. You can interpret a value of the chi-squared statistic with an expected value by using the chi-squared distribution with the appropriate choice for the degrees of freedom parameter. It answers the question whether the particular value for the statistic you found is exceptional. If that's the case, you find the null hypothesis of independence so unlikely that you reject it. Without correcting for the number of cells, the size of the chi-squared statistic can however not be interpreted by itself and doesn't tell anything about the effect size, that is, the strength of the association. Several indices have been created to express the strength of association between two nominal variables, and the most popular is Cramer's V. This is the equation by which you can calculate it. You have to take the square root of the chi-squared value, divided by the total number of counts and the index m. m is the smaller value of the number of rows and the number of columns minus 1. The value for Cramer's phi ranges from 0 to 1, regardless of the size of a contingency table. The value of 0 means that there is no association between the variables and the value of 1 means that there is a perfect association. This is the case when you would know the category for one variable if you knew the category of the other. Let's calculate Cramer's phi for a few contingency tables to see how it works. This is a 3 by 2 table with no association. The chi-squared value is 0.5 and Cramer's phi is 0.07. And this is a 3 by 2 table with the same marginal distribution, but a strong association. Now the chi-squared value is 14.4 and Cramer's phi is 0.39. There's something to keep in mind, however, with Cramer's phi. The less square the contingency table, that is, the more unequal the number of rows versus the number of columns, the larger the index tends to become without strong evidence of a meaningful association. I'll illustrate this point. Let us consider this cross table of six rows by six columns, which are totally unrelated. The values are randomly generated integers from the range of 10 to 60. For this table, Cramer's phi has a value of 0.18. Now, if we reshape the table to have respectively four, three and two rows, the index increases up to 0.36. So in summary, you have to take care with interpreting Cramer's phi. Values of 0 and 1 are clear, and furthermore there is no issue if you are comparing tables of the same dimension. However, the larger the difference between the number of rows and columns, the larger the value for Cramer's v becomes, even when there is no association. Another aspect of interest, when interpreting contingency tables, is to get an idea about the pattern of association and find out in which cells particularly high or low values are observed. For this purpose, the residuals per cell can be used. The residuals per cell are the difference between the observed and expected frequencies. However, these have to be standardized somehow because the residual of 1 in a cell with an expected value of 2 is a lot bigger relatively than the residual of 1 with an expected value of 200. If we divide the residual with the standard error for the sampling distribution of the residual, we would get what we want. This standard error is calculated by multiplication of the expected counts in a cell with 1 minus its marginal column probability and with 1 minus its marginal row probability, and subsequently taking the square root. The resulting standardized residuals follow a z-distribution, so their values can directly be interpreted as how many standard deviations the observed frequencies are away from the expected frequencies. Let's apply the analysis with standardized residuals to this table. 
As you can see, the values in the second row are much higher than those in the first. Now if you calculate expected values and next the residuals per cell, you can see that for instance this cell and this cell right below have comparable residuals, whereas in this cell the residuals are almost three times as small as here. Let's go on to calculate the standardized residuals by dividing each residual with the standard error. It turns out that in the first pair of cells we considered, with comparable residuals, the standardized residuals in the second row is a lot smaller. In the second pair of cells, on the other hand, with quite different residuals, the standardized residuals are in fact quite comparable. The table with standardized residuals shows that especially these cells in the third row with values of 1.6 and minus 2.1 show observed values which deviate a lot from what's expected if the variables were independent. Let me summarize what I explained in this video. You can express the strength between the categories in a contingency table with indices that are based on the chi-squared statistic. Kramer's fee is a popular one. It ranges from zero for a case with no association to one for perfect association. However, at intermediate values, the index is not purely measuring association. It also increases where the difference between the number of rows and columns in the table increases. The pattern of association in a contingency table can be analyzed by considering standardized residuals. These are calculated by the difference between observed and expected counts divided by the standard error of the residual and are interpreted in the same way as z-values.